The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Ben, there's been a lot of talk around town about your performance on Q&A. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and how they had to use all the B-roll they could find. They were cutting uh, to pastures in th- Austria. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really sad because, like, my sense is that I'm not old and out of touch and uncool. And yet... <laughs> All the evidence points to the contrary. (laughs) Tēnā koutou katoa, hello. It's day 43 of lockdown here in Tamaki Makoto. It's late on the evening of Wednesday, September 29th, 2021. Today we had 45 new cases in the Delta outbreak. <sighs> How are you going, Annabelle Lee Mather, Ben Thomas? Kia ora te ai here. How are you going? Yeah, I'm not doing too bad. Thanks, Toby. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, thank you for staying up late with us, and thank you for listening to us. Hopefully it won't be um, too bleak. How are you feeling, Annabelle? Um, well, I, I've finished... Um six series of Downton Abbey since I've been in lockdown, so now I feel like I've got nothing mm. to live for. But besides from that, I'm all good. Okay. Ben Thomas, how are you going? Um, last week was pretty good because all of my consumer electronics arrived. So I've got, like, you know, like I got a TV so that I could oh. play on the Wii that I bought from Trade Me. Um, and you know, sometimes I like to just Skype into the group and talk about like our Wii consoles because we're gamers. Um, right. I've been air frying up a storm. Tell Um, us about the air fryer. How's the the, air fryer? The air fryer is real good. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's incredible marketing, right? Because it doesn't fry anything. Like it's, it's, it's just, it's just a small oven that works well. Um, so I I confess, I don't really know what it is. I sort of like to mention that things sort of float in it like, you know, like astronauts on the surface of the moon. How does it work? It's It just, it heats food. Right. You, you, you put it in a tray and then it gets hot and then it cooks. Um, so there's not, there's not really any frying going around. It's kind of um, stealing, mm. stealing uh, fat valor. Mm. Um, but it's but it's good. It makes, makes your chicken legs crispy and delicious. Okay. The Herald... Um, like had an amazing exclusive last week with Alison Gofton, mm. and she says she says air fryers are rubbish. Mm. I, I called a I called a journalist pitching a story, and I was like enthusing about my air fryer, um, mm. you know, just because you know I'm desperate for human contact. So as soon as I get somebody on the phone, you know, it's like mm. you know, let me tell you about my last week of frying chicken legs. Um, and then, then the, the, the pitch failed because um, by the time I got to it, he was expecting like an air fryer promotion and a free air fryer. Mm. And then he, he didn't want the story in the end. So, look, we're, we're all learning a lot about our craft. <laughs> yeah, we're, all, we're all learning a lot about ourselves, aren't we, uh, as we enter what seems like the seven or 800th week of lockdown here. And um, also, look, uh, a couple of people have been in touch to say you guys are very focused on yourselves in lockdown and what about the rest of us outside lockdown? And I just got to say, sorry, 
uh, we're going to keep talking and feeling sorry for ourselves about being in lockdown. Yeah, how, about, how, how, how about how about how about they get fucked? How about they go to a bar? How about they go mm-hmm. get some table service somewhere if they're mm. so fucking bored? Go on. <laughs> Uh, that's not all the people who've corresponded this week. There's, there, there were, there, there's been some uh, interesting constructive correspondence, which I might get to later. I don't want to be all Kim Hill on it, you know. Um, the exciting thing is, ladies and gentlemen, that we have got so many different plans for the COVID response. If Ben <laughs> Thomas had been on the phone talking about a novel response to the novel coronavirus rather than an air fryer maybe he would have had more luck we've had plans in the last few days from all of new zealand's main opposition parties from the act party from the national party and from the sir john key party uh uh, beginning on sunday where his opinion piece appeared in every just about every new zealand media outlet um we're yet to see whether or not haven't seen the latest coffee news yet but hoping it'll (laughs) crop up there too ben you will have been reading these eagerly these page turners yeah parts one through four um it very much is like a a, like a, a middle earth trilogy what's your what's your wide angle take on the COVID response plans, please. Uh, I have, oh, I'm sorry, I've been really busy today and I haven't uh, waded my way through um, the national oh. uh, one. Um, 58 pages, 58 pages, the national one. Yeah, um, keep it short, guys. Um, you know, we, we're we not we're not concerned about policy. Like, who's who's baked a cake recently? Yeah, look, apart, with, with the exception of ACT, who uh, seem to be very much in the kind of, um, you know, human ingenuity will beat the virus once, 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 once you know, um, once it's free and living alongside us, you know, open borders, um so that so that everyone can kind of come in and 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 set up small mini communities, um, a viral load. But apart from that, <laughs> look the the general tenor is basically that we all want to open up society uh, and live as freely as we can with the virus, as safely as we can with as high a percentage of the population vaccinated. Um, and the only disagreement really seems to be. Uh, you know, whether we actually take uh, steps now towards that or whether we kind of just sort of hope that it happens as if by magic. Um, the government was probably, you know, seemed to be in the sort of latter camp uh, around the weekend. Um, today's announcement and the John Key, you know, first the John Key column and the reaction to that seems to have brought forward a, a very speedy announcement um, about the, you know, trial of self-isolation for business travellers, um, which seemed to be on the back burner very uh, mm. uh, very recently with the Auckland outbreak. Uh, but su- suddenly that was a very um, imminent uh, proposition uh, after Key's uh, column. And I think the, the announcement of the 45 cases, y- you get the sort of sense that the government... Um, you know, they haven't said that they're abandoning the elimination strategy, uh, but at the same time, with 45 new cases announced today, ministers were still talking up, uh, opening up, uh, you know, going down to level two next week. So I, I actually think there's less uh, difference between these plans, um, you know, th- than might first appear. Um, Annabelle, I don't, I don't know actually been about that pilot program. It may be, there may have been a difference in the extent to which it was emphasized and foregrounded, but I think we were expecting to hear about it this week and they had said they were going to go ahead with it. So it's only 150 people. Annabelle, I was looking back this afternoon at the, the government plan, which was called reconnecting New Zealanders with the world. And I was, I went to, I thought, gosh, now I need to look back to see when that was. And it was only a couple of days before the Delta outbreak, which sort of surprised me. I had to check it about three times. It was, it was on August the 12th or something like that, that that was published. You remember there was that event at the National uh, Library with, with, uh, you know, the all-star lineup. Um, But if you compare that report and the National Party plan that came out today, um, in fact, there's sort of more detail in the National one because it covers 
uh, MIQ in detail. It covers uh, mandates and passports, and it covers, you know, it's, it's comprehensive, w- w- whatever one thinks of it. It covers immigration. Um, as Ben says, in terms of their broad direction of travel, they're not that much different. It's just that there's a sort of specification of some timings and some percentages, which uh, one can debate. What did, what, what, what did, what did you make of, of, the, of the national plan and all the different plans that have been springing up the last few days? Well, I took quite a scientific approach to breaking down the various of plans. Did. Of course you did. Um, by doing the spin-off quiz on who oh, yeah. said what about each yeah. plan. Yeah. And um, I, yeah. I got like two out of ten. So <laughs> um, I, so I think it's fair to say that, you know, there is a lot of similarities in the plans. Um, I, I, I don't think that although it's been described as, you know, impossible to achieve, I do think there's merit in National's idea of purpose-built MIQ facilities mm. and building them in a place that's um, where there's a lot less um, humans walking around, mm. uh, like Crown Plaza, to reduce um, infection. But to me, I think that you know, for for a plan to be a genuine plan that people can consider, it really needs to have numbers attached to it in terms of what people think are acceptable levels of hospitalisations. Mm. Um, specific numbers of hospital beds that will be added to the current system to meet that demand mm. and and how many deaths they're comfortable with and, and any plan that doesn't include that is kind of morally bankrupt really because people need to be able to really analyse what the actual human cost is of opening up our borders. It, it, it certainly was, there was a moment where I think... Um Henry Cook from Stuff asked about ICU capacity and Shane Ritty, who's the national health spokesperson and the deputy leader, acknowledged that, yeah, there there just isn't the capacity there. And that's the legacy of successive governments, isn't it? That underpins all of this, even as we move up through towards hopefully higher vaccination levels, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, shortly, then we don't have... Hello for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The ICU beds, we don't have the provision. And that is a kind of inescapable limitation on all of our decisions in this territory. Yeah, and one thing that people in the sector have been talking about is <clears throat> it's not it's not just the infrastructure, it's it's actually the um the manpower. Um yeah. it's it's the people available. And, you know, I mean, again, you sort of come back to, well, what what were we doing in that kind of 12 months, say, that we brought ourselves with that first lockdown? Um, that was a period where it was very hard for non-New Zealanders to come into New Zealand, where, we, you know, there's still stories of medical professionals leaving now uh, because they, they can't get their residency uh, because families, you know, couldn't get over the border and they were separated for the, from them for, for months and over a year in some cases. Um, and, you know, that seems to be one of the glaring failures. You know, we had this COVID free paradise status and we, we don't seem to have capitalized on it to get the people that we need, um, to have that capacity. Because, yeah, you know, if any, any kind of loosening, from now, you know, if we go into level two next week, as the government seem to be signalling, we will have a, a a pretty big expansion of ca- of cases. Um, you know, what it looks like, um, hmm. and and you know, there, there is a question. You know, obviously, see, public sentiment seems to have turned a lot towards sort of reopening, but at the same time, you know, most New Zealanders you know, far from not knowing anyone who's died of COVID, don't even know anyone who's had, you know, dysentery for a week from COVID. Um, and and the sort of 
the the levels of sort of sickness in the community, even without mm. serious cases or life threatening cases, might come mm. as a bit of a shock. Mm. Um, it's not just a lack of um, investment over the last year. It actually goes back um, decades, and all you need is, uh, I mean, even over winter, you know, our hospitals were overwhelmed mm. with um, with what was the the flu that was hitting RSV. the kids, uh, uh, RSV. Mm. But but every winter, um, all our hospitals complain complain of being overwhelmed. So I don't think you can blame just this government for that. It goes back over successive governments over years and years and years. And, and the other thing too, there was a really good article in, in Newsroom um, about ICU beds and John Key's plan and it's not just it's not just staff either it's also we don't have the technology just simply in terms of the the IT systems that our hospitals operate on. And one of the things that has also become clear over recent days especially today is that a really large proportion of the people who are caught up in this outbreak are people who are kind of on the margins of society They're people who live in transitional accommodation. You know, halfway houses is the, is, is what we would normally call those Mm. and emergency accommodation. People who don't have secure homes. And that too is the result of years and years of neglect and underinvestment. And for successive governments, this isn't about mm. one particular government. This is about crises that have now come together, two crises, a health crisis, crisis in the health system, and a crisis in the housing system. And the thing that terrifies me is that, I mean, we've seen a bit of this. Uh, hopefully we won't come back again, but you do feel when people are on, our ed- on the edge <clears throat> and all these cases reemerge that the anger is likely to in many cases, be directed towards the people who are the ones who are at the sharp end of it rather than the people who have failed to provide the proper resources over the years. It's pretty disappointing, eh? Because this time last year, you know, there were stories being done, including by our program, about how this was a once in a lifetime opportunity to deal with homelessness and all of these homeless people getting put into housing, and that's obviously fallen apart. The, the infection rates for Māori at the moment is now at 16%, which is actually for the first time since COVID arrived higher than what we are in terms of our percentage of the population. And, mm. of course, Pacifica are up, at, up around um Uh, about 64 now but you know it comes back to that saying of what's good for Māori is good for all New Zealanders and when you start to look at the regional breakdowns of Mm. you know where vaccinations are going well where there's strong uptake and what iwi are are doing a really great job in terms of being able to roll out mass vaccinations like Ngāti Whātua and others you know iwi that have had settlements that have had the chance to like build up their manpower, their wealth, their infrastructure, they're in a much better position to be able to dig into those hard-to-reach Fano members and help yeah. them while helping the rest of the community, including Pākehā. But for the iwi that have been um, subjugated for a long time, that have had a particularly rough relationship with the Crown where they haven't had the settle- their settlements, those are the ones who are really lagging behind in vaccination rates. And it's not just about reaching those whānau or getting to where they are, it's overcoming decades and decades of suspicion, mistrust, mamai that they feel at the hands of the state. And now it's coming mm. home to roost in those communities. And we have a pressure that compounds all of that, which is that the latest numbers on vaccination, which is our way out of this, have it probably isn't too much to say that they've stalled, right? Like the you look at the you look at the line on first doses and it's nose diving. Uh, we've got a real issue here and those hard to reach communities that you talk about, Annabelle, is a is a is a massive part of that, isn't it? I mean, it's something that's addressed in all the plans and, and that, that, it, that, that stuff needs to be done. And, you know, John Key yeah. wants buses outside nightclubs. And I mean, I kind of wonder 
whether it's it's actually one of those things where it's there isn't a solution. There's a hundred different solutions that need to be attempted at the same time. They're, they're, I mean, in some ways, we're almost victims of our own success in terms of the elimination strategy. Because when it's out there and it's swirling around, people get freaked out and they 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 book in and go and get their vaccination. But I thought John Key's piece really showed his naivety about understanding what's going on in New mm. Zealand because. There's a difference between vaccine-hesitant people and hardcore anti-vaxxers. And a vaccine-hesitant person or just a time-poor person, you can, like some iwi are doing, offer some hangi, some hangi packs, come down in the car, drive through, jab, get your hangi and off you go, that's great. But if you're a hardcore anti-vaxxer, a $25 voucher is not going to cut it. It takes mm. it takes work to like get into those communities, build up trust, use the health professionals that they already have existing relationships to do that. So, I mean, frankly, some of that stuff in that column, which will just seem so divorced from the reality of what some Fano are living. Yeah, I, th- I thought there was. I thought there was some um, criticism of the key column, which you, you know, what was that term that we used, that used to get thrown around, key derangement syndrome. You know, where um, you, you had sort of commentary, you know, online. I've been trying to stay offline, but um, you know that. Key's suggestion that Māori and Pacifica providers be given, uh, you know, extra, you know, extra funding for each dose they administer, basically, um, you know, that just sh- showed what a racist or scum he was. But you know, if you, I think the very next day, Colin Tukuitonga was saying on Radio New Zealand, you know, they actually have the c- c- they have the capability um, in South Auckland, the, pro- the Pacifica providers, to go door-to-door for testing, uh, but they don't have the funding and the resourcing. And if you mm. can give them, you know, a certain amount, for, and the, this is, you know, for vaccine, because I think it, it, eventually it will have to be like census. I think Henry Cook noted that in his stuff column. Mm. We actually are knocking on people's doors, understanding why they don't want to be vaccinated if, they don't, if they're not being vaccinated, and be able to hook them up with somebody who will be able to go in and, and talk to them where they feel most comfortable. Um, and, and that is a resourcing issue. Um, and it doesn't have to be doctor. You know, you don't have to have doctors knocking on every door. You know, this, this can be the sort of thing, you know, census used basically student job search people. And you just need people who can talk to the people in their neighbourhood and, you know, figure out what's going on with them um, so that you can then take further action. And I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's promising sort of signs. Counties, Monaco, DHB says that they've got a program uh, for, uh, you know, in the home vaccinations. Um, but, but again, it's sort of it's targeted rather than general. And I actually think in order to... In order to get every, you know, if, if you're if you're you're going for a hundred percent vaccination, you can't afford to be targeted, uh, because again, as Henry pointed out, as you've pointed out, you know, there are people who are just going, to, you know, who are hard to reach, um, and and it does, you know, you really do have to literally go to them, not just park up a bus in their town centre. Mm, like go that's to right. Them. Um, and you know, look, there are some people who will never get vaccinated. Um, you know, I know I know a guy who is. Um, one of the uh, victims at Lake Alice, right? And, you know, was subjected to the most appalling abuses of power by, by a government entity. Now, you know, you, he's, 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 he's quite strongly anti-vaccination now. Now, <laughs> that, that, that may not, you so, know, his, his, his fear... Who would have thunk it? His, yeah, his, now his, thunk it? His, his fears aren't founded in this case. But what do you, you know, I mean, he gets a pass, right? <laughs> you know, after being tortured as a child, you know, he gets to say, yeah. no, I don't, I don't want the vaccine, right? But in most cases, you're right. Vaccine hesitancy isn't like staunch anti-vaccination. It's just people who aren't sure, they don't know enough, and you can break through, right? Right, mm. and um, and and we have to be targeting everybody. And uh, yeah, e- even though there are good signs of that, you know, promising signs here and there, um, I just it doesn't seem like the government has a kind of holistic strategy the same way that it does for the census every time it does it. Um, at, at the risk of uh, doing a uh, Ashley Bloomfield shout out, we did uh, get some an e- email over the last week from someone who's working extremely hard in Tetai Tokoro, getting up at four o'clock every morning and took exception to the dismissive 
description of the rollout being slow. So a big shout out to all the people who are working hard in different corners of the country out there trying to get the people of the people um, vaccinated. We really appreciate it. This has gone by lunchtime. We'll be back in a second. One of the parts of the National Party plan released today that got a fair bit of attention was the MIQ facility chapter. Um, and we've seen, of course, the whole kind of bingo, lotto, housey lot lobby happening overseas, um, which is more visible now because people get these, you are 16,000th in line and don't even let them have any fruit machine fun around it. But obviously, you know, we've seen countless stories of people whose situations are really, really awful just, you know, in their, in their hundreds, all these situations with relatives who aren't well that they want to see, families put apart, all that kind of thing. And um, one of the, this, there are pretty, some pretty heroic ambitions in the national plan in terms of building these uh, custom quarantine facilities. But, of course, they don't have to build them. But what it does do, I think, is shines a light and I think this goes as well for the criticisms around both antigen testing and saliva testing. These are things that should have been done some time ago. In terms of the testing, the Roach report came out now one year and one day ago. It was presented to government by uh, Roach and Simpson, and it included urgent attention to saliva testing, which could make people more likely there's evidence that people are more likely to provide testing. As far as MIQ facilities are concerned, on this very podcast, the you know we three high-level epidemiologists were talking about Ohakia as a place where you could you know build a Swiss village of chalets or whatever. What do we know? But it's not so much a question. It seems to me necessarily Annabelle of whether or not those things can be done by Christmas, because probably they can't as far as the MIQ facilities are concerned. But it does suggest that the government, the ministry, have been moving too slowly in some areas, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, the the um, the spit test one is, you know, obviously one that's been going on for a while, although it is not as reliable as the... Um, as the, the Cotton bud in the brain, the brain stirring of the yeah. Yep. Um, I, I have enormous aroha for everybody who wants to um, who wants to come home to Aotearoa for whatever reasons, and and isn't able to. And you know, I can only imagine how frustrating it must be when you see international sports teams. Um, getting priority over people who are wanting to return to, you know, be with a dying loved one or bury a loved one or, you know, make it home in time for their baby to be born. Um, At the same time, I also feel enormous aroha for whānau who have been um, affected and infected Um, with COVID and, you know, have had to watch their loved ones on life support and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, I think um, obviously the system is not perfect and does need improvement and um, you have to question the way some groups are getting prioritised. But I think to say that, to offer a plan and say that all New Zealanders could be home by Christmas is just a unrealistic and and two incredibly irresponsible because those people coming home not that through any fault of their own um, pose a real danger to people who are already here and you know we've seen one person un- unwittingly from Australia go on to infect mm. a thousand people here and I think to to sell people. Um, well, to promote a plan like that when when you can't even put a number on how many people might die as a result is um, pretty unfair. I mean, it seems strange that <clears throat> there haven't been that many efforts, you know, there hasn't been any effort to build purpose-built um, MIQ uh, 
and I think, you know, one, one of the arguments about it, um, you know, I think late last year was, well, actually, look, the vaccine's coming. We'll probably be through this by the end of the year. What's the point of starting building one now? Mm. Um, yeah. and, and of course, you know, here we are. Um, and yeah, look, I'm not, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a builder. <laughs> So I, I don't know, but like when, whenever I go down to um, Fakatane, the place that I love to stay is the Fakatane Holiday Park, and I usually stay in one of their cabins, um, which is basically um, old flood relief housing uh, hmm. because the, those planes flood a lot, uh, and I think it's it's old flood relief accommodation from the Edgecombe floods from a few years back. It's perfectly serviceable. People pay you know hundred bucks a night or whatever to stay there. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with knocking up, you know, quick, you know, mobile units. Um, it, you know, that, that sort of, you know, I mean, I guess, like, again, I'm also not a sewage engineer. I'm more of an epidemiologist and a, a virology expert. But, yes. um, you know, if, if you're in that kind of area, you know, you, you would have like a lot of, uh, you know, you, you know, ventilation, lots of area to walk around, that kind of thing. So I don't... Uh, it, it, it's it seems strange that there's there's you know that there's no solution. I mean, you know, maybe Kiwi Build scared them off, but it, it, it seems implausible that you know we know temporary accommodation does exist in New Zealand for emergencies um, that we, that we couldn't do it, especially if it could be repurposed later. You know, yeah. so that emergency housing isn't isn't overcrowded or, you know, in basically gated communities run by gangs. Um, so it's, it's, it's not like there won't be demand for housing in New Zealand at any point in the foreseeable future, right? That, that, exactly. That's right. Just just put in whack in a mezzanine floor and call it a tiny home for two central <laughs> city lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, on, you know, bull's borders. It's attractive, <laughs> I think. Um, one other part of the... Um, National Party plan that was just about gazumped by Labour concerned the immigration component that Erica Stanford has been leaving. Um, and we've seen a release which hasn't, it, it, it's, it'll come out tomorrow morning, so it'll be published by the time this podcast is in the world. But um, Chris Farfoy has announced that I think around 165,000. Migrants in New Zealand will be given a pathway because everything is a pathway now um, and uh, sort of freed from the appalling situation they found themselves in when they were locked down in COVID. But Erica Stanford, I think, stumbled upon that on the Immigration NZ website, Ben. Yeah, it was another hack, just like the uh, Gabriel McClough ha uh, Treasury hack from a few years ago. Um, somebody went to the website and saw what had been put <laughs> up on it. Um, we think the Russians might be responsible or possibly Except the Chinese. On that one, it, was, it was when they found things by doing searches. Doing, right? yeah, like yeah, the searching search the search I, think, whereas, I think this one was just this, on the front page, was wasn't it? <laughs> actually looking at the website yeah. and seeing it there. Yeah, um, yeah this, is, this is more social engineering. Um, I mean, look, great, great get for Erica Stanford. She's really set the pace in that portfolio. Um, and again, Chris Farfoy has been busy. So he's, he'll be announced, he was announcing that today, um, and accidentally announced it yesterday. But also in the house yesterday, um, some, some very suddenly introduced, uh, measures about, um, commercial leases, um, kind of forcing, uh, mm you know, requiring landlords to, to reach a, quote, compromise with their mm. um, tenants if we go back into level four again, um, making it, making it uh, you know, not, not allowing landlords to terminate uh, residential tenancies during mm. level four if we go back in. Um, and a whole raft of things, which, which actually sort of made me reflect on this lockdown. Um, and, you know, the students have been talking about this as well. There were a lot of sort of um, bespoke or discrete measures that were rolled out for that first lockdown. And, and some of them were just sort of automatically brought out again, like the wage subsidy, for instance, or the resurgence payment. But then a lot of them, for instance, uh, allowing students to get their, you know, another lot of... Um, Live, uh, what's called um, cost related costs under their student loans um, mm. and these these tenancy measures particularly for um, residents you know renters um, 
were, were kind of neglected during this lockdown. And it almost, it, all, it was almost the sort of sense that, well, actually, we know how to do lockdowns now. Everyone can get through them and they're nothing to be that scared of. And so well, there weren't quite as many protections put in place as maybe there were last year when things were a bit uncertain. Um, but but that in itself, you know, caught people by surprise, uh, you know, again, students and renters. Um, and, and I think also uh, custody arrangements as well. So... Yeah, I don't. I don't know. It, it sort of adds to a kind of, kind of ad hoc feel to how um, this is all being kind of conducted. You know, whereby forty five new cases is still consistent with the elimination approach, and mm. um, yeah, and 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 you know, there's some concern that you know what I, you know. They're, they're pretty strong measures, um, you know, for instance, the one, you know, forcing landlords to come to terms with tenants, you know, probably very welcome for a lot of commercial tenants. But um, th- this idea that, you know, they would just be sort of announced uh, announced on uh, Tuesday and passed into law on Thursday without having been spoken of in the previous seven weeks of lockdown, um, yeah, it does seem a little strange. I mean, it's, I suppose, complicated on two fronts. One, because first time round, we all thought that the economy was going to be absolutely flawed mm. as never before, and turns out it wasn't. It and turns the out- second one, and the second being that no one really anticipated that this lockdown was going to drag on as long as it has, I think. You know, there was still a kind of confidence that it was going to be shorter and sharper despite the evil Delta tail. Delta dawn. Delta Dawn. <laughs> Delta goddamn Dawn. Well, speaking of Dawn, it's um, the sun is rising now <laughs> as we <laughs> towards the end of this podcast. Um, Bells, have you got any uh, anything to take us out on? I feel like you have probably some profound thought that you can, um, you know, raise our spirits with. I've got nothing. Nothing. Like, like maybe... Um, Maybe. Not even like a smug hermit kingdom like metaphor thing that I could play. Takeaways? What about like a um uh what did you call what's the thing you've been watching? Um, Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey. Maybe there's like a little <laughs> allegory in that you could share. Nothing. 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 Fuck. I had Pizza Hut the other night because when we here turned four. <laughs> Hey, let's talk about that. Is that a a thing? So Waimehia Rose, who was a guest on this podcast a lot of times, right? Like maybe seven, eight, nine, ten times? Well, I mean, In in some important ways, birthed by this podcast. Literally Um, birthed by this podcast. uh, uh, And actually, she was co-hosting for like the nine months of her gestation. And then for about a... (laughs) another yep. six months after that. So yes. she turned four the other day and I'd ordered her a whole lot of stuff online and none of it turned up on time. So then I had to do like an emergency <laughs> dash to the supermarket <laughs> because she really wanted makeup for her birthday. Uh. But the only the only makeup they had at the supermarket was, was like a matte L'Oreal mm. lipstick. Mm. And you guys won't understand this, but... That, that colour fast stuff, she put it on on Monday and she literally still has, like, pink lipstick mm. right, right around the whole of her face. She looks <laughs> like she's got cold sores. <laughs> That's all I've got, sorry. But well, she thinks she's cool. She thinks she's cool. And she is. Uh, bless you, Wami here. Happy birthday to you. Um, happy birthday to everybody. Happy birthday especially to members. Uh, and uh, we'll be back again on day 612. Kia ora. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora e te iwi, Kiaihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spinoff. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spinoff member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.